So it's a privilege to be among such uh, august company, the luminaries on the stage and also in the, in the in front of us. So I'll not take much time because we are running short of time. I'll give short introductions. So I'll start with Dr. Bikramjit Choudhury. He's an MSTAT from the Indian Statistical Institute and a PhD from the Indian Institute of Technology, Mumbai. Dr. Choudhury had a long stint at Nielsen where he rose to the ranks from a senior research executive to S to a SVP. He has been also working abroad in Switzerland and Cyprus for this company. Post Nielsen, he has held key positions in reputed multinational organizations such as KPMG, Seven Dots, ZS Associates among others, working in India and Europe. In his current role at Datamatics, he is working closely with the executive team and extensively with clients across BFSI, healthcare, retail, manufacturing and telecommunications. He has several research papers and articles published in various international index journals in the areas of statistical modeling, fraud diagnosis, market measurement, consumer segmentation, big data analytics, currency demand forecasting, people analytics among others. Dr. Chaudhary has also received multiple recognitions from SOMR, NASCOM, MRSI and various media houses in the country for his work and contribution in the field of research and decision sciences. Thank you Dr. Chaudhary for joining us. Prasanna, I will not say much, he has already been introduced in the earlier <laughs> session. I will now talk about Pejawar Saab, I and Pejawar Anand go back a long way, you know. So he has been appointed as a whole time director of SBI General Insurance Company. Prior to this position, he had, he, was, he had joined as Deputy Managing Director on December 6, 2021. Just prior to his appointment as DMD with SBI General, he was associated with SBI Life Insurance for 16 years, last posting as President reporting to MD and CEO. Backed by a vast experience of 38 years, which ranges from Life Insurance Corporation of India, LIC, to banking, cooperative banking to local banks and international banking, financial distribution to the top management of SBI Life Insurance. Sri Pajawar is, a decor, is, decorated, is a de decorated with several recognitions, professionally and personally, the, lit, the latest one being the Mumbai Ratna Award. Congratulations. Bestowed by the Honor, Honorary Governor of Maharashtra in July 2021. He is an eminent thought leader with an eclectic vantage point on various insurance related matters. He has also represented the insurance industry on various committees constituted by GOI and regular both IRDI and RBI. He is an alum, alumni of Columbia School, Business School, Manhattan, New York with a certificate of, manage, uh, certificate of management development program, other certifications from IIM Kolkata, ISB Hyderabad. He has completed his post-graduation in financial management from KC College and holds a Bachelor of Science from University of Mumbai. Sri Pajawar has been elevated as a whole time director of the company with effect from 28 November 2022. Mr. Praveen Kumar Gupta is a former managing director of the State Bank of India. He superannuated from SBI in March 2020. As managing director of SBI, he led the entire retail banking operations of SBI comprising over 22,000 branches, spread over 17 local head offices, 58,000 ATMs and a business correspondent network of 60,000 customer service points. He was also instrumental in launching all the digital initiatives of the bank including the flagship YONO. Earlier he looked after the risk and compliance functions of the bank and also worked as CFO of the SBI. Mr. Gupta also served as MD and CEO of SBI Capital Markets and as Deputy CEO of SBI Macquar Infrastructure Fund. He is currently non-executive chairman of Utkarsh Small Finance Bank Limited and also a future generally India Insurance Company Limited. He is a public interest director in the board of NSDL and is also on the boards of four other companies. Mr. Gupta is a past chairman of Forex Exchange Dealers Association of India, FedEye. Mr. Gupta was a member of the MSME Experts Committee headed by Mr. UK Sina, former chairman of SEBI, constituted by the Reserve Bank of India. Mr. Gupta holds a bachelor's degree in commerce and is also a member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. He is also a certified associate of the Indian Institute of Bankers. Thank you, sir, for giving us the time. So before we proceed, we will talk of a bit about data analytics, data and analytics, let me put it that way, cyber security and AI. 
Now analytics has, analytics is not something new, you know. Analytics has been happening even before Christ, let me put it. When the wars were fought, when logistics were to be organized, analytics was still being done, but at a very different level. With the advent of computers, networks, networking, you know, computer power, networking power, and the skill sets, it has gone to a whole new level. Now, the question arises for banks. For example, if 85, 90% of your transactions are happening offline, I mean not at the branch, by offline I mean not at the branch, then you're not meeting your customer anymore. So what do you know about your customer? You have to depend on data to identify the customer, know the customer, know his wants, desires, and fulfill those desires by creating a database and running analytics on it. We will talk of those as we go along. Also another th thing which has happened is we are always playing catch up with the customer. See the customer is using Amazon, the customer is using Flipkart, the customer is using so many sites, Zomato, Swiggy, and getting things done in an instant. Now he expects the same sort of service from banks or insurance companies and uh, he would not, if we cannot provide such services as was being discussed in the earlier panel that you know we are taking time, turnaround time is high, the banks will end up as dinosaurs. Bill Gates has said we need banking but we don't need banks. Banking can be provided by many other people. You know loans can be given and are being given by fintechs buy now pay later loans, any other, all sorts of loans, all sorts of banking services are being provided by other entities today. Disruption will happen. The largest mobile company, the largest camera seller in India may be, may be Nokia. The largest music provider may be Airtel. You see, so the disruption is happening and disruption is happening in banking also very, high, very much. So before we proceed further, I would like Sri Gupta, sir, if you can talk a bit on data analytics. Yeah, thank you, Kajal. And uh, thanks to ICC for inviting us today here and giving this opportunity. Uh, I think a lot has already been said on data analytics in the earlier session. So some of what I was going to say uh, may be a repeat of what has been already said in the earlier session. But I think as Mr. Ghosh rightly said, data analytics actually is two words. One is data, second is analytics actually, okay. And what has changed in the last about say 10-15 years uh, is about the availability of data itself actually. You, you can run analytics only if you have the data available actually. And when it comes to the data availability, in so far as say the banks are concerned, so there is a lot of internal data that is available now and there is a lot of external data. See, as far as the internal data is concerned, you know earlier the banks had the manual ledgers and all, you know, so there was no data available within the banks you slowly move to the CBS systems and now you have a centralized uh, data that is available. There are question marks about the quality of data within the banks also. I think there are a lot of legacy issues, so more or less a lot of them have since been sorted out and the quality of data that is available also has improved. I think what has changed very significantly is the external data that is available now. I think one of the big game changers there actually is about the digitization. And if you look back at the process, I think it's probably started with the demonetization. I mean, demonetization has been criticized for various reasons, but I think it really spurred the entire digitization process in the country, and a lot of people moved to digitization. And uh, of course, with the UPI now being widely acceptable, the amount of data that is become available on account of digitization is huge. And I think that the second big change that has happened uh, in the country is the GST and uh, earlier you know you didn't have any data on the business turnover on how the uh, firms are operating it was not available at all actually with the GST now that data is available and it is possible for the banks to actually even give business loans in addition to the personal loans using the GST data. The other big change was of course the bureaus. I think there was some discussion on the bureau data being available uh, in the earlier session also. Uh, see with the bureau data, the two, three things have happened. So one is that uh, because data on the bureau is available, you have a credit score on the customers. So you can decide, you know, who is credit worthy, who is not credit worthy, whom to give a loan, whom not to give a loan actually. Okay, so what kind of risk you run when you are giving a loan, knowing what the bureau score for a person is actually. The second I think is more important is 
because everybody knows that the bureau scores are getting watched, it actually keeps in check the future behavior of the customers also. I think every person now knows that, you know, if they are delinquent, they don't pay the loans on time, their score will get impacted and they may not be able to get loans in future. Uh, you know, like we are talking about uh, personal loans or the digital loans being given now. In SVI, I think in 1990 itself, we had actually started personal loans and car loans. They had a scheme called SCOOM, but most of the, those schemes actually did not fare well because the bank did not have, first of all, availability of data in terms of how credit worthy the person is. And secondly, even if there was a delinquency, you didn't know what to do actually. You didn't have a bureau to report the delinquencies to actually. So I think all this data now, you know, again, the income tax data is available. So there are a lot of other data sources. Aadhaar is one. Uh, even mobile data is available. You can do the data uh, scraping of what is there on your mobile. Uh, there is a data available even on things like, you know, how many gas cylinders somebody has used. Now, okay, with this, so much data has become available. The next challenge, of course, for the bank was to using analytics to put that data into uh, actionables and workable so that you can take actually decisions based on whatever data is available. A lot of investment has gone in. I think somebody spoke about uh, that also. Um, you convert this data into leads, okay? Then the challenge again is how do you convert those leads into business opportunities actually, okay? So one is that typically what the banks will do is, so you have generated a lot of leads based on whatever data analytics you have run using both internal as well as external data, but how do you convert it into business actually? So you typically you pass it on to the branches, branches will take up with the customers that, in fact, was a very costly, lengthy process, actually. That is where the digitization came in. Uh, I think Tambe spoke about how using Yono, the bank has been able to deliver these loans digitally, where the customer doesn't have to go to the bank. You download the Yono app, you can check eligibility on the app itself, and even draw the loan using the app itself. I think and that is where, you know, the, again, importance of something like having a good CRM system comes in, actually, you know. CRM system allows you to track all the leads that have been generated. You can follow up with your staff, with your customers, and then see they are converted into business actually. Okay, so banks have made a lot of investment, not only in terms of technology, I think even resources. You know, you have a lot of analysts, data scientists working within the bank who are continuously looking at data. The biggest game changer that is going to happen in future, of course, is account segregator. That again was discussed in the last pen. Um, most of the banks have already started reporting the data to the account segregator. SEBI has recently issued a circular saying that even the mutual funds should start reporting to uh, account segregator. In fact, the amount of data that account segregator can collect is huge. I think we haven't even touched the surface of what account segregator can do. And then what happens once all the data becomes available with account segregator, which means that you have a situation of totally open banking. Anybody could go to, anybody give consent, that person can download data, convert it into business opportunities and deliver digitally also. There has been some criticism recently about digital landings of RB. Uh, the RBI has brought in some curves on what the fintechs can do. Maybe that is something we can discuss a little later. So I'll stop at this and maybe the other panelists can also add to this. So thank you, sir. That was informative. And uh, sticking to data for just a minute, you know, uh, so the whole lot of this data which comes in has to be stored somewhere in a data warehouse or in a data lake. State Bank has gone in for a data lake now from that moving out and it has to come in timely. The relevance of timely data is very important to do proper cross-sell and action in time. You create a customer one view page of all your customers. All of you, if you have an account with State Bank, we have a customer one view of you where we can see all the deposits, all the advances and also the civil score or the credit bureau score, I should not use the word civil, or the credit bureau score and your value to the bank using uh, transfer pricing mechanism methods and then using a tool to know what are the next three course, best courses of action with you, what products to sell, what products not to sell. So uh, we have also got project impact, the insurance data, the general insurance data also all comes to us and is factored in there. 
and as sir said how to now to decide the next loan to be given for example and what sort of repayment he has been doing based on all that and his civil score also how to pre approve that loan if he is a good borrower or a potential good borrower and how to also use the crm omni channel to propagate it to him through the internet banking through the branch through the call center it can all be done now insurance is a big area and in most parts of the world insurance is bigger than banking in terms of volumes and all so i would request uh, anand to you know throw light on how they are using data thank you sir um, first of all uh, thanks atanu sir for inviting me here and uh, uh, get giving me an opportunity to share that dais with wonderful stalwarts of banking whom i worked uh, uh, when with uh, sbi um, data according to insurance people i'll speak on both life and non life is uh, we call it the next gold that's the kind of value data has got um how do we use data in the insurance field uh, before that i think insurance companies more on the life side is uh, the biggest repository of data that can happen for the longest period of time and the most current one what i mean is that life insurance policies go for 10 years 15 years 20 years 30 years some go even uh, whole life so it's almost 40 45 years you have annuity payout starting for 20 years 30 years 40 years so that data which the customer provides to the insurance company is the most latest one the most updated one and that is what is probably the biggest repository for uh, any insurance company both on the life and on the non life side now having received this data it's a huge onus on the insurance company on two things one is the data management how do you manage the entire data and number 2 how do you maintain the uh, data leakage data protection uh, thing where the data doesn't get leaked out because this is something which is uh, going to come very very soon in fact it was supposed to come in the earlier avatar which is now changed it's going to be a little more stricter when the data uh, loss prevention thing and the data privacy act will be brought in so both life and non life insurance companies uh, on uh, you know on behalf of which i'll be talking in this session is going to have a huge onus on how to take care of the data so i call it data management system which is there now coming to the next question of how this data is used and this data analytics i think uh, insurance company is one sector where analytics is used the most and it is not just in one field that it is used it is used in several uh, activities that the insurance company does for example if i start with life insurance as um, uh, gupta sir mentioned if there is a customer of the bank and if there is a tie up with the insurance company how do you identify which customer should be given which product so that could be one analytical model starting from there so it's a pre sale analytical model that comes in once you have that model the leads get into the system and then the, the customer is approached once the proposal comes in then it undergoes a data analytical model which tells you whether this customer is a high risk medium risk or a low risk based on certain criteria as what product does he buy which area does he in and all that stuff so it helps you in the right recognition of the risk identification of the risk pricing of the risk and acceptability of the risk so all these things which we call it as underwriting process is hugely uh, backed by the analytical models which are being developed and continuously upgraded over a period of time once the policy being issued comes the next which is policy servicing and more importantly from the life side and the non life side is the renewable process of the policy now there have been analytical models which we have developed which tells you right in the beginning when you underwrite the policy itself whether there is a probability of this person lapsing his policy uh, in a future time so that also helps you to build up your renewal management system in a much 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 better manner so we have seen that some customers pay on time you don't even have to call them they just ensure that the money gets the premiums are paid some you have to call them at least once or twice and there are some who will in, in spite of calling them 10 times they will not even pick up the call they will not even pay for whatever reason it is so now with analytical model in place each of the companies are in a process uh, you know in a in a much better thing to segregate the customer base data into various segments and then use their marketing tactics and the marketing things to probably attack those kind of customers renewal happens what happens at the time of claim now in insurance industry fraud claims are one of the biggest issues that each and every insurance company faces 
So analytical model based on the data that you have, based on the past experience of your own company and the industry as a whole. So you have something called uh, information, uh, Insurance Information Bureau of India, IIBI, which uh, has the data, it's a repository of the data for the entire industry. So you have a tie up with them and they share the data as and when you ask for it. And then you can look at your data with their data and then work out a propensity model of which of these customers could probably turn up into an early claim or maybe to a fraudulent claim. So these are some of the models which are working very, very well uh, as far as analytical models on the insurance side are concerned. One more place where analytical uh, modeling has helped very much is how do you create new products uh, for the customers on life and non-life. So based on your data, based on what information you have, based on the KYC documents that you have, analyzing those things, the pattern of thing, the profession, the way he's uh, uh, paying the premiums and all that, you can actually come out with products which are most suited and you can do customer segmentation based on analytics to try and say that for this customer base, this is the right product that probably we could uh, target for and that's how the penetration in the life and non-life is also increasing year after year. Especially if you see in the last two to three years uh, post uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, I think analytical models are being upgraded and being used very, very frequently on the insurance side for a lot many activities that happen uh, in this particular segment. Thank you, Alan. That was great. In fact, I read somewhere that you know when you do a car insurance, the insurance company today can check how fast you drive, how quickly you turn, what angles, how do you brake, you know, and they can give precise so the risk, how risky you are to be insured, they know. So they will they can ask for individual premiums also from individual customers going into all that depth. But now we'll move a bit. Of course, there's nothing going away from data anywhere, but we'll talk a bit about artificial intelligence, you know, and machine learning and deep learning. I will not explain these terms. I'm most of you are aware also what is the difference between these and Dr. Chaudhary will do it in greater detail. We'll also talk a bit about big data, including social media and other data which can be used and which is being used by banks, insurance and other companies. And uh, so many examples are there. And also we will talk a bit about 5G coming in and IoT expanding. Because see, when 5G comes, everything is going to get connected and everything is a computer today, once they get connected. The washing machine is a computer, the car is a computer, so everything will become digital and everything, every computer can be hacked. Malware can come in. So everything is now at risk. So how to protect those risks? So Dr. Chaudhary, Dr. Chaudhary is a very erudite person, so I would like him to throw light on these. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kajula. Um, and thanks um, ICC for inviting me to this forum and share my views. So it's a very uh, broad based area that we are talking about. All right. And uh, being in the proximity of some of the banking stalwarts, I will talk less about domain, more about the advanced analytics, data science, cognitive science areas and the applications of those. So uh, we started by talking about data, right? Now, data is getting created at every nanosecond by all of us. I am speaking, I am generating data. Every device is generating data. And the form of that data is now, nowadays, in the last few years, is mostly semi-structured and unstructured. And that's the transformational change that's really happening. So when we are talking about digital transformation as such, whether it is banking, financial services, insurance, telecom, healthcare, manufacturing, logistics, whatever, the major difference that is really coming into play are because of the self-generated data, data getting generated from every device, and the format of the data being mostly structured and semi-structured. So that really requires a very different landscape, very different ecosystem to handle, to manage, and eventually to monetize, because that's really the entire objective, right? So from that standpoint, uh, Kajol, um, uh, he was talking about data lake. And why we are talking about data lake? Because the warehouses 
are not really well equipped at this moment to handle semi-structured or unstructured data. Right? You have to think about a lake or at least a hybrid repository in order to be more futuristic. And there are plenty of organizations who have moved into the sorts of lake environment. Now coming back to some of the technologies that we were talking about. Now there, could, there is a popular misconception that some of these are new technologies or emerging technologies. Let's say cognitive science, artificial intelligence. In the 1960s and 70s itself, AI was very much in vogue. But why was it not popular? Foundationally two things. One, the computing power at that point of time was very, very low. Be having the ability to manage terabytes and petabytes of data, which is today's world, is a sort of a cakewalk, almost cakewalk for many of us, was unthinkable. So GVs and MVs were intimidating, right? So computing power have transformed the game. That's number one. And the second part, which I talked about, the data that is getting generated, the proliferation of the data, what is being called about as big data, and big data is not volume only, right? The velocity, the variety, the veracity, along with that, the volume, right? That is really coming in, which is really transforming the overall game. So cognitive science, as we know today, is a game changer or a potential game changer. In many cases, it is impacting our lives very, very significantly is predominantly because these two propellers have come into play in tandem and in conjunction. One is the different types of data sources, variety, velocity, volume, and the second part is about the computing power. We are no more intimidated by petabytes and terabytes, right? So <clears throat> hence, when we are talking about the applications of cognitive sciences, the, the examples that were being talked about, for example, in the banking and in the, in the case of insurance. So the, um, the data sources that were really being used, for example, in the case of fraud diagnosis, in those erstwhile days, if you look into the way fraud diagnosis used to happen, at the end of the day, detecting a fraud is almost like identifying a needle in a haystack. It's as complicated as that. Most of the time, the data will be highly imbalanced. And you will have to do it in almost in real time. In order to do that, it's not only the traditional data sources that are really being leveraged today. There are lots of other ancillary and auxiliary information that are coming into play when you are trying to em empower the model and the algorithms to detect those potential frauds in real time. And I would em emphasize on the word potential because you can never be, detect uh, be definitive at the beginning. But what's really happening is in the, uh, those erstwhile models, the false positives used to be very significant. And that used to create a lot of mayhem from a reputation standpoint and all those things. So over time, with our ability to train these models, on huge quantum of data, we are being able to get very precise estimates and understanding of what are these potential frauds. When we are talking about persistency in this case of insurance, the, those predictive models are nowadays much more cutting edge, at least the potential of them becoming cutting edge also because, again, of the multiple data sources that are in play and the huge volume of data that can be handled. The cross-sell upsell, for example, in the space of insurance, right? In, in many organizations, it is a sort of a hierarchical structure. You first try and understand affinity of an, of an prospective customer to be attracted towards a certain product offering. That's number one. Then from there you filter if, for example, that customer has to come in, then what are his propensity of making a claim? Because that creates a loss in the environment, in the ecosystem. 
And then, obviously, with that, you have to also augment and amalgamate the probability or the stochastic chances of that individual actually undergoing a churn. So eventually, when you are trying to filter your prospects, you are going through a three-stage process. Affinity for products, and then probability of making a claim has to be low, and churn probability also we have to be within reasonable limits. In the space of marketing analytics, for example, the reach outs, uh, we were talking about segmentation or even micro segmentation, but in my view, those are obsolete. The opportunity is in personalization and hyper personalization. The whole objective of KYC is not to go through a routine process. I know my customer. Do you, do you really know? If you know, then you would be able to tailor made your campaigns in a very, very precise way in terms of the channel affinity for that customer, the content affinity for that customer, and you will really reach out in a way so that the customer gets that feeling that I am actually being understood. That is really the fulcrum and the decisive factor for enticing a customer. And it's not only for enrolling new customers, it is about enriching the relationship with the customer. It is about aborting a potential churn. All these things, it is even about collection in delinquencies. When we are reaching out, the, the content and the medium, the way it's being reached out makes a decisive significant difference to the way eventually you are being able to make a decisive impact on both top line and bottom line. So I will sort of stop over here. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. So he actually said, you know, we cannot think of segmentation at segmental levels. We have to do a segmentation of one. Every person is an individual customer and you have to understand him. So there, tools are available to do that if you have the database and you have to use those tools to sort of get down to exactly what that person requires and do it ahead. Now, he also talked of big data and also monetization. So I'll just give you a very small example in one minute. For example, in State Bank, we actually, somebody said, when it was uh, introducing me, say, they said we are number one in the world, but we have monetized Facebook also. We earn a lot of money. One example, just there are many examples. If you have taken a scholar loan from State Bank, which is a high-end loan of 20 lakhs, 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs, studying for ISB or even I am today are costly and abroad. Now, you see, Facebook, May I have, somebody has not repaid. So one person doesn't repay. And they have mostly gone abroad and all. Now if somebody has not repaid, I have his date of birth and I have other some data about him. I can verify that data using, there are uh, other sites actually, census site, people like, there's a site like that. And I can confirm he's the same guy. Having confirmed, and you have to talk to Facebook about it, I can send him a message because he's on Facebook. Any I am guy or Christchurch guy or Dunedin guy is on Facebook. And he has written the proudly I'm Facebook and I'm working say for Microsoft in Seattle. Now after talking to Facebook and not going into the details, I do send him a mail and there are extra charges which Facebook charges, uh, takes from us. Send him a mail saying Ki, we used to have an engagement which has got disconnected. You know, we, we are very proud that you are working with Microsoft in Seattle, it starts like that. And then we are at an engagement which has got disconnected. So could we please renew the engagement? and money comes back immediately. Why do you think it happens? Because of the first paragraph where I've written, we are very happy that you are working with Microsoft in Seattle. So he knows the next letter will not go to him, but will go to Microsoft in Seattle. And they won't tolerate people having taken loans. And this, is, this has worked very well. And it is being used for other loans also by, the, by banks and state bank. So that monetization happens. But now we have to look to the future. And who's the future but Prasanna here, you know, young, youngest among us all. And AI, I will just, you can talk on any topic you want about the future, where you see us in 2025, 2026, you know, all this digitization taking us. And it is very difficult. You know, we can't say what will happen tomorrow. So to 2025 is not an easy thing, but there are several uh, trends which are happening, for example, AI. Now, Elon Musk as well as Richard Dawkins have said AI is dangerous. It is going to take over humankind and may be the end of us. Now, I would like Prasanna to talk on these subjects. Yeah, I think uh, uh, great insights by Vikramjit sir and Anand sir and Praveen sir. It was like a symphony, keep on uh, learning, listening, right? And come out of that uh, 
what is going to come up uh, next, right? What we have seen, uh, which is traditional to digital journey so far, but while we are moving into some intelligent journey, we have to rely on uh, what has happened in the past. So I think in the past, uh, CX was something, right? Customer experience or uh, UX. Now, sir spoken about HX, which is a uh, hyper personalization. How do we take care of uh, every customer out there? So that uh, what happens in a cross uh, industry, like we play games and we see somebody's red, somebody's uh, orange and green. So how do we keep an eye on uh, all the customers, right? How we can see the view of all the customers are green. How do we make them green based upon their data? Or a customer could see that, okay, by the time, if I want to really save 50,000 rupees at the end of a year, these are those notifications has to come in his phone or wherever he move around. These are the things if you do or if you don't do, you are not able to be a green at the end of a year. So that kind of a gamification is coming from a cross industry, which we have seen in the gaming. It will certainly will come in the banking insurance, uh, wherein uh, as a branch manager, as a corporate officer, we'll have a view, right? Uh, while we have a, a segmentation, micro segmentation out there, but certainly we'll see how many people in this area are green or uh, orange. So I think uh, quite a lot of a uh, combination of uh, things will happen on a uh, front side. So front office, which was always mobile internet, will have a next view, right? It will be much more of an invisible experience, uh, invisible interfaces where I want to do transaction just like in the air. In the metaverse, how will I be able to do those transactions or uh, uh, I'll be able to do those transactions with some consent, right? Sitting at an office, how can I give a consent for uh, my refrigerator or my car who is doing transaction on behalf of my, these customers? So you may see this will not happen. So go back in 95, we said we'll order some food uh, and food will come, right? With uh, some logistic ecosystem. But tomorrow's ecosystem will be more smarter. Those will be robots will come or uh, some uh, connected cars will bring on the experience to you. Uh, Ola Uber is uh, some other model which we have seen, which was not there. But down the line, it, that also will extinguish or some other uh, model will come into the picture, right? So while we are in part of a uh, intelligent era today, uh, or entering. So this era is backed by AI and as sir rightly said, AI was always there, but now we have that kind of a computing or age computing is coming and uh, giving the backbone to, or maybe we are talking about quantum computing. We'll give a drive to how AI will really help. We heard about chat GPT uh, recently, which will really take off Google's monotonous or uh, many more other uh, new business models will come, right? So I think uh, technology will always uh, embark on what backbones we have created so far. So certainly we will see how AI will really create a bi-directional banking. What banking we had, monotonous, we have to go to the bank. Now banks will give back those notification, incentivization. So I really don't have to worry about banking, right? Banking is just like a breathing around those services. What I will be worried about, what all those additional value added services, I'll give back to that customer to keep him uh, green on a health side or on a peace side. Th that is how we will see the next industry revolution or a next uh, evolution. Maybe we always talk about some term called as society 5.0, right? So, so banking will be always invisible layer. It will be always around. Insurance will be always around. As you right, rightly said, your insurance will be driven dynamically. Based upon that data, I will allow your insurance score is uh, up or down, right? We'll be, see how he's driving, how he's breathing, what all his symptoms we have. A lot of data we have in the external world. Uh, we heard about uh, external data, internal data, moreover structural, unstructured data. And this technology will really create a 360 degree customer persona in front of uh, systems which will give back the actual services to them. I don't need any some banker to see these uh, data and then call back if this is something available for you. That can directly go to the customer and customer says, yes, I am okay to go for this service with some consent and uh, it is available to them, right? So tomorrow's customers may not be the actual human customers plus combination of with the machines. Your devices, uh, customers will carry at least four or five devices on the, on the body like gadgets and their external devices also become those customers. So your form factors will be invisible. Your home can become a mobile banking uh, factor, right? We'll keep on doing transactions on them, themselves or cars likewise, right? So AI is going to be quite a uh, good backbone. IoT is, uh, is almost quite mature, but how these IoT devices will talk to each other is going to be very, very helpful. How a, a car which is being created by many more IoT devices and by default, say example, some accident happened. That car will talk and automatically will calculate this which is my damage. Let me give that notification to all the actors in that blockchain or a chain. 
कि दिस मच इज माई डैमेज एंड दिस गाय हैविंग दिस आइडेंटिटी हैविंग दिस अकाउंट ही रिसीव द क्लेम ऑन द स्पॉट द वे वी ऑर्डर फूड टूडे इट मे टेक थ्री डेज और सेवन डेज बेस्ड अपॉन लॉट ऑफ ऑपरेशनल प्रोसेसेस बट द इंश्योरेंस प्रोसेस विल ऑल्सो विल बिकम अ मोर बेटर विथ अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ अ मेनी टेक्नोलॉजी सो ए आई अलॉन्ग विथ ब्लॉक चेन आई ओ टी इज गोइंग टू बी द नेक्स्ट जनरेशन ऑफ अ इंटेलिजेंट फाइनांस वाइल वी टॉक अबाउट इंटेलिजेंट फाइनांस वी कैन इमेजिन समथिंग विच इज ऑटोनोमस फाइनांस right which happens just like that i enter in the bank branch i know maybe i will not be entering bank branch only for banking but many more other cross sell services so branch may not have a banking but uh, many other services so tomorrow's branches bank branches will have a banking but non banking service also available so that we can reuse that real estate which we have invested for so many with thousands of branches for last 30 40 years and so on so how do we reuse that real estate for uh, better uh, human services not only banking but uh, non banking also with the help of a data so these branches can read term um, as a some uh, station or something where we get some more or less lot of services right so likewise in this autonomous world we will see how metaverse or how 5g or 5g by the time we took or talk about 5g will end up in a 6g or something more or like that right so uh, the way we have created lot of regulations or controls back on a mobile apps or back on a internet apps or back on a branch banking there are a lot of controls and every year we get uh, some advisory from uh, regulators rbi and so on so these controls will go down will not require those controls why because these controls will be uh, automated by technologies i may not require password tomorrow because it will be biometric or behavioral biometric automatically it will guide as i enter in the branch or come out automatically my transaction or authentication may happen so likewise while we have seen digital banking or uh, uh, intelligent banking so tomorrow's era is going to be uh, autonomous banking where uh, data uh, uh, or uh, uh, like minded uh, party coming together on a chain where data will be not at a centralized location but at a decentralized location kyc control on a customer chain today kyc is stored at aadhar example uh, aadhar kyc or aadhar uh, data right so tomorrow's kyc will be in my pocket i'll be carrying my own kyc i'll be in control of that kyc i will decide which bank which company will use my kyc for how long within that kyc i may say that out of those 14 parameters only 12 parameters can be utilized for next 3 months so i think we need to see how autonomous world will bring on but it always happens in combination of lot of research lot of validations so i think what we will see tomorrow regulators banks Uh, uh, will keep on coming with a lot of platforms we heard in earlier session and this session also uh, but this platform will be more and more and more autonomous they have to cohesively work with the current technologies and while we make this more robust we'll welcome uh, many more uh, technologies i think at least for next 10 years ai uh, uh, blockchain and uh, iot and many more things will remain while we welcome many more other uh, trends which we keep hearing from gartners and so on so one but uh, point uh, uh, the way gartner has predicted many more things are going to come in 2021 and look at their report in 2022 there was no uh, uh, relation at all they changed their complete stance the way covid has changed everything so we may not be able to predict the way chat gpt came in our life i don't know what yes. more things will come Uh, facebook was not there it came uh, and automatically everything has changed we never know which influencer which company will become tomorrow's googles or that's how is the generation which we are living we may predict we may say these are the trends but we need to be ready for some un uncertainty which is going to be helpful for a human so that's how we are moving ahead and good to see that uh, uh, everybody understand that government and many more other that but i think long lasting banks will remain regulated entities will remain people may say banks are not not necessary but they are the government they are the one who drive or insurance come they are the the one they drive what is that required for uh, customers technology will always come it will act as a only enabler we may keep on predicting this is going to be tomorrow this is going to be but we have to live with a today's fact uh, and there are many more areas we need it to, to cover considering the aspiration for uh, complete countries financial uh, uh, inclusion we keep on discussing the last topic but it's a beautiful time good to see that uh, now banks are now adopting new skill sets 
the way we have not seen chief digital officer or chief data officer or chief risk officer down there and just before five years and last 30 years banks were operating only with the CT or information security or some EDP department it has changed right it's not only banks even the regulators are now bringing new companies RBI innovation up was not existing or national payment corporation of India so likewise we may see national data corporation of India or national KYC corporation of India or lending corporation so I think lot of uh, uh, collaboration is going to uh, happen lot of uh, new entities will come to accelerate the whole momentum good to see st how startups fintechs tech companies are also understanding and giving back to the society to make it uh, uh, more robust so in future what is going to happen innovation collaboration and right time collaboration uh, before uh, maybe in 2008 we have seen uh, nokia coming into uh, or some uh, uh, some wallets right which was before time there were many innovations happened in the past, they were before time. For example, iTunes was before time, but Netflix is something which is on time. We need to see what is the timing, how the customer is moving, so that we should not become absolute like Kodak or uh, some or other, other those business model which we have seen. We need to see what customer is moving in, the, in, the, in their day-to-day -day life in other industry. And let's bring on that cross-industry innovation into BFSI, so that we remain in the... Uh, existence for a longer period. Yeah. Thank you, Prasanna. Thank you, Prasanna. That was very insightful. He has tried to predict the future. A brave man can do it, but he has also qualified his statements by, you know, it is not possible to predict the future. So, some things he said, just one, 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 more, one more minute. He said the branches should be not, not for transactions, but for actually marketing, which the bank, I'm sure Sarah has been driving that. So, bank has moved in that direction. Transactions happen because some customers cannot use all these other channels. So that is one reason. And about what he said, IoT, State Bank has done IoT. We control our electricity in Mumbai in five, six branches to the central office We're using body sensors, which will tell us that there's nobody in the room, but all the ACs are running. You can shut it down centrally, all those sort of things. Also, a person can leave his office. Experiments have been done. And, you know, the message will go to the rice cooker to put the rice on boil, the washing machine to start at his house, the garage they get to open when he's so many distance. And the fridge can actually order stuff from the store. If the milk comes down below a certain level, it can send a message to the store and get replenished and the payments will be done. So all those things are happening. And yesterday I read Chat GPT has brought such a change in the American. Some student has written a fantastic essay on artificial intelligence, but then the teacher had a doubt. So they asked him and he said, it is, the essay has been written by Chat GPT. So you know that Chat GPT can do everything and every, anything. I wish we could, I have got such great people on the stage with me. I wish I could have asked more questions, but Savantan there is repeatedly pointing at me <laughs> to close down the session. So before we close down, there, I would uh, request Dr. Lokesh Gupta. So we can take two questions from the audience. Ah, we can take questions. Or one question, yes. Please kindly introduce yourself and ask the question. Yes, please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Vincent. I'm from Stockholding Corporation. Uh, as regards this PMLA, PMLA information which comes and that fraud analytics is there, that reporting which we have to do to FIU, how can it be effective? Because what is it that we get alerts from them, from the depositories? And how is it that we can report to this thing? Is it on the basis of customer profiling or what? We don't understand that part. We are blind. That's all we need help for that. See, see, basically this alert reporting is based on two factors. First of all, you need to profile all of your customers actually in terms of, you know, whether they are high risk, medium risk, low risk. And the second factor is the transactions that are happened in the account actually, okay? In most of these cases, again, you need to build scenarios. So what scenario would require reporting to FIU or not actually? So based on those scenarios, you report. I think the preliminary analysis of all of those alerts that the system would generate would be required to be done by the reporting entity. And if you have a reasonable doubt at that stage, uh, this needs to be reported to FIU. Some of these uh, reportings need to be converted into STRs. Uh, some of these reportings as it is are required to be mandatory reporting. Ultimately what happens to that, 
uh, is that the FIU has to take a call. So they take analysis of all of uh, these uh, alerts that go to them. Where they think, uh, you know, they need to take further action, they will do further investigation and they will take action. But I think the important thing from a entity which is reporting these alerts to FIU is that uh, you should not give any kind of alert to the customer from whom this reporting will happen. Uh, I think sometimes that is a difficult decision for the reporting entities. So sometimes like within the banks also, so you have a customer on whom there are some suspicious transactions and you need to report an STR. So while you report this to FIU and they may take action or not take action, but at the same time you can't prevent operations in those accounts. Because if you prevent operations, so this could actually amount to tipping off to the customers also. So I think one has to make a very fine balance there. But this reporting is absolutely essential actually. So this is again a mandatory requirement. I don't think you have any other option rather than just to report whatever scenarios have been given to you.